conversation led to was her anticipation and her looking forward to the coming of the Savior, where she could leave this life and go to the life beyond. The morning after her passing, I was reading in my one-year Bible, my personal devotions, and the reading for that morning was, or that day, was Psalms 90. It wasn't too long that the phone rang. It was one of the brothers asking, said that her, that his mother wanted me to have the devotions at the service and um, wondered if I would accept that. I assured him I would, and immediately Psalms 90 came to my mind. A little while later, another son called and said that she did request that you use Psalm 90. And I rejoiced in that, and I glorify God for that. And um, we'll say a little more why that verse meant, that portion of Scripture meant so much to us as well as her. If you care to, turn with me to Psalm 90. We want to read the first ten verses. I don't really think she traveled very far. So no, Kentucky was about as far as she went that direction, and Pennsylvania that direction. And, uh, and as I did a little figuring, unless she had crossed the line somewhere, I don't think she traveled but six states in her long journey of life here. While some of us could say that I've traveled more than that, some of you have been maybe almost in every 50 states, one of them, every one of them, you might have said, well, she missed out a lot in life. She didn't get to see all the beauty that God created. But I believe her interest was in spiritual things. I don't think she ever had a passport to leave this country. But I believe she had an eternal passport to leave this land and to leave this journey in her life and to go to life beyond. And I'll tell you something this morning. That's far more important than having a history of all the states and all the beauty and all the things that we've seen. And, um, and it was just such a blessing still to visit with her and talk about her joy for the Lord and how she loved him. I remember one of the last times she said, um, she said, I'm just looking forward to going. And she said, just stop and think about how it's going to be. I'd just like to somehow imagine how wonderful and how great it, it's going to be. And you know, the Bible even tells us that death is an enemy. But in speaking to her, you didn't quite get that idea of her life's journey. She gave birth to twin sons. And she's the, she was the great grandmother of five sets of great grandchildren. I think that's pretty special. I think that's very special. And uh, it was just a blessing to visit her and to talk about the things of God. And her love for her family. Her love for the church. All we can say to the praise and glory of God is this. That she was a very faithful church member. Loved to listen to you preach. And she would often take time to thank you for the message. May God continue to be glorified.
part of it. And as we were going down the sidewalk, I remember telling my family something like, you know, if I'm half as sweet as she is when I'm old, I think I'll be satisfied. And I would like to say to her sons, Brother Ivan, and Tom, and Alan, and Urban, uh, thank you for your inspiration in the way you and your wives and families have cared for your mother, your precious mother. May God bless you richly for the example that you left, and we give God all the praise and all the glory for what you Our sister prayed that God would allow her to live at least long enough to take care of her sons, of her family, until they were old enough to take care of themselves. I believe it is safe to say that her prayer has been answered. And God has allowed her to live far past that time. And now she has been able to care for many of her grandchildren and even her great-grandchildren. God abundantly answered her prayer. I didn't really have any idea that she used to play hide-and-seek with her grandchildren. But I guess that's what she did as an older woman. And to the young, to the grandchildren and to the young great-grandchildren, I uh, no, I don't have to tell you this either because you know it much more than I do, but you had a very special grandmother. And she just seemed to get sweet of the kingdom of Israel. He was contemporary to Isaiah, to Hosea, to uh, Jonah, and to Micah. And the ten northern tribes of Israel during the time of his ministry were pretty much at their peak economically and politically. They were a power, powerful nation at the time. And it was a time of prosperity and optimism for the nation of Israel, the twelve northern tribes. It was about 760 B.C. And things were going well for Israel. But they had forgotten God in their prosperity, it seems. And what they didn't know was that disaster was just around the corner. For in 721 B.C., that brutal Assyrian invasion happened. And they came, they came down from the north, pillaging and killing along the way. And many of the people of Israel were carried away captive and never heard from again. And the ten tribes, just 40 years after this scripture, were wiped off the map, and we still don't know what happened to them, the lost ten tribes of Israel. So Amos spoke at a very crucial time in Israel's history, a time when God's judgment was about to fall. They didn't know it, but it was about to fall. And it reminds me a lot of today. And I, I was able to take one of Mary's Bibles and look through it, and there was a note in the front that said, and she's speaking of society at large. She's speaking of the world and their attitudes about eternity. She had a note in the front of her Bible. It seems today heaven holds no appeal and hell holds no terror. And I think her assessment of the attitudes of society are pretty much correct. It's known then as old people's pneumonia. Her mother's lungs simply filled up with fluid, and the doctors didn't have the means to take it off of her body. And I guess she finally, her mother finally drowned in her own fluids, and poor little Mary, 11 years old, watched her die. It was more terrible than we can imagine. At the same time, her father himself was in bad shape. Her mother died, I think it was in in 35 or 36, in 1931, her father, Seth Yoder, came down with a, a severe affliction. He began to develop open sores on his back near the spinal column. And there again, medic medication in those days uh, didn't take care of it. And these open sores finally led to cancer. And I don't know who took care of him during this time, Perhaps, no doubt, she had to fill in with some of the household management and so on. The household and maybe the farm duties, I'm not sure. But eventually, as the record goes, it, they said it turned to cancer. And he was in immense pain 
over a long period of time and finally died in 1937, about a year and a half after her mother had passed on. And now she was an orphan, having lost both of her parents to cruel illnesses in the space of just about 18 months. Can you imagine that? Are there any 12-year-old 12 12 year old children here? Can you imagine what it would be like to lose both of your parents to illnesses like that and have watched them die? And then times didn't get any easier, really. She was put into other homes and wasn't always treated well, as it often goes. And she had to work very hard. And eventually she ended up with Joe and Leah Kanegi, my grandparents. And that in itself must have been an adventure. She came to uh, Stewart's Draft in 1943, uh, right around the time when... Um, Ben B. Swarry, her future husband, also moved to Stuart Straft with his parents. Once when we were visiting with our family not so long ago, within the last year, I think, she was telling us some about these hard times and she didn't like to talk about them much, but we sort of had to draw it out of her. And um, I asked Mary, what got you through these hard times? What got you through these hard times? And she thought a little bit, and then she responded, I talked to God about it. He helped me. And she said that with such a sweet smile. And you know, this is how we knew her. This is how all of us knew her. We really knew her. She didn't have many friends back then, but she had God, and she turned to Him for comfort. And she just kept talking to God all throughout her life. And this is how she prepared to meet her God. What those hard times did for her, I think, those hard times must have created a fertile soil in her garden. West, all the way to Nebraska, some years before, I'm not sure how many years before. And they lived there for some time in Nebraska. Now he's moving his family back east to Belleville. And on this last leg of the trip, they were on the train going through the mountains of Pennsylvania. It had been an unusually wet spring. And a lot of rain had fallen the night before. In the afternoon of May 31, 1889, that train approached the big stone bridge that crossed the Connemaw River in Johnstown, Pennsylvania. At that time, the bridge was just a year or two old, and it still stands today. Normally, the train would have stopped at one side of the river or the other, maybe to take on more passengers or leave off passengers or to take on water and mail. But as they approached that bridge, there was a signal out by the tracks, frantically waving the train on. And he waved the train on. And as the train passed by, he kept shouting, the dam has broken, the dam has broken, the dam has broken. And the engineer opened up the steam and that train thundered out of the valley just ahead of the wall of water that swept down from that lake 14 miles away in the mountains. And recent research has shown that the volume of water that came down out of that mountain from that lake that was, I think, two miles long and one mile wide was equivalent to, at least for a short time, the equivalent of the flow of the Mississippi River. When it reached Johnstown, it was 40 to 60 feet high. Over 2,000 people died including 80-some, as that big stone bridge trapped 30 acres of debris that washed downstream. And, And it caught fire by the bridge and burned many people to death right there. If that train had stopped, it would have likely have gotten swamped by that wall of water and would never have gotten away. Grandchildren and great grandchildren Mary's father, your ancestor, 
was on that train. If that train had stopped, we probably wouldn't be here today. Think about that. Today, there is a dam that is holding back a flood that will soon break loose. The water is rising. And when that dam breaks, when it finally does break loose, there will be a flood of unimaginable, eternal proportions. The flood rising behind that dam is the just wrath and judgment of a God against the rebellion and sin of this world. Let us pray.